This presentation represents a review of basic EEG data and includes a great deal of material that we've already covered in classroom presentations. However, it's a useful review tool, particularly prior to taking a, an exam or just to refresh your memory about the different components of EEG recording. So, recording a scalp electrical recording from multiple sensors or a single combination of sensors, always remember that it requires at least three sensors to produce an EEG recording, and that is the positive sensor, the negative sensor, and the reference or ground, the system reference or ground, often designated the active reference and ground sensors. These are placed on the scalp and or neutral locations like the earlobe or the mastoid bone behind the ear. And of course the signal is processed by the amplifier and displayed on the computer screen. In this case a 19 channel recording. We are measuring electromagnetic fields that occur in the cortex but we're measuring them from the scalp surface. Again, there's a positive negative gradient within the cortex created by the cellular mechanisms that transport mineral ions, which contain various electrical charges, positive and negative, uh, into and out of the cells, creating these electromagnetic fields that are the result of difference is in aggregations of positively charged and negatively charged mineral ions causing electromagnetic fields uh, in the millivolt range in the in the cortex uh, subsequently attenuated by all the structures in between and re reaching the scalp el electrode uh, as microvolt level uh, electrical readings that they are then sent to the EEG amplifier to be processed. These electrical fields, of course, are produced by interactions between multiple areas of the brain, uh, cortical to subcortical communication systems like the thalamus and the different nuclei of the thalamus interacting with their various projections to the cortex and then projections back from the cortex through the thalamus and out to the body. Again, the frequencies are associated with the functions of the brain, so simple tasks that don't require a lot of communication across long distances that are not complex, that require only local neurons to interact with each other to produce a result, can happen fairly quickly, even as fast as uh, frequencies associated with the fast beta range, uh, 60 hertz, also sometimes called gamma whereas uh, somewhat simple tasks but still requiring some uh, attention and focus may uh, happen at frequencies from 25 to 55 hertz. Um, frequencies associated with more complex cognitive tasks may happen at somewhat slower frequencies but still in the faster beta frequencies in the 22 to 34 hertz range and more global communication associated with uh, global with uh, complex tasks. Now, these specific numbers are related to this particular study on primates and don't reflect actual values associated with human EEG, although uh, they do correlate essentially in terms of the relationships between the speed and the frequencies associated with these tasks. We're talking about communication again between subcortical structures, incoming afferent uh, sensory neurons, for example, uh, bringing information through the thalamocortical relay system, uh, projecting to the cortex for processing and possibly action. Uh, the inhibitory effect of the reticular nucleus, trying to stop anything extraneous from coming through, uh, focusing on things that have a significant 
or sufficient level of intensity and uniqueness that they deserve attention from the cortex. The reciprocal communication pathway back from these projections that uh, in, increase inhibition once the, s the s signal has been sent to reduce the possibility of multiple signals regarding the same event being sent over and over again. Um, the inhibitory function is pretty strong, uh, dominating the system so that only the most intense and most interesting information gets through to be processed. So again, the purpose of the oscillatory activity is to organize the communication between local uh, groups of neurons and far distant groups of neurons to organize tasks, to organize processing of information. Uh, the more complex and longer distance the communication requires uh, slower frequencies and the localized processing can happen at faster frequencies. Uh, the nesting of rhythms of the EEG with slower frequencies organizing the activity of faster frequencies is uh, has been well documented in multiple uh, research studies and it's been demonstrated that this coordination is responsible for much of what we are able to do in terms of cognition and processing of information. Um, so the resetting of the phase of ongoing oscillatory activity to endogenous or exogenous cues, uh, so external or internal cues facilitates coordinated information transfer within circuits between distributed brain areas. So uh, as these frequencies occur and then uh, reset in phase and go back to being in phase and then subsequently reset and then back in phase in a synchronous firing pattern uh, is how we organize and coordinate all of this interactive activity. So phase resetting is a critical marker of dynamic state changes of functional networks, which means the networks are engaged in a task, then they are released from that task, then they get re-engaged in it, the same task or another task, and this uh, often on resetting of the uh, communication pathways is what organizes and and uh, orders these processes so that they don't bunch up or run into each other or happen at the same time or in an uncoordinated manner. So phase reset sets a neural context, a narrow band uh, frequencies that uniquely characterize activated circuits and lead to this interactive coordinated communication. It imposes coherent low frequency phases to which high frequency activations can synchronize. Again, uh, this example. So lower frequency synchronization, coordinating and organizing the faster frequency synchronization that allows us to recall character strings or memories of other kinds, uh, learn tasks, and so on. So all of these are related to this process. Um, and so these are cross-frequency correlations across large distances. They're critical for neural coding models that depend on phase and increase informational content of neural representations. They likely originate from the dynamics of canonical E uh, in, in excitatory inhibitory circuits that are anatomically ubiquitous throughout the cortex. Um, so phase reset reorganizes oscillations and diverse task concepts. All these things that we do and that we think of as automatic processes are all associated with this phase resetting mechanism. Sensory perception, attentional stimulus selection, what are we going to pay attention to? Cross-modal integration. Okay, I heard something, I saw something, I felt something, I smelled something all at the same time. Uh, we have to integrate all of that information and this phase resetting process is how that happens. Conditioning, spatial navigation, um, neural excitability, ensemble organization, groups of neurons that get together to do a task, functional networks that coordinate and organize those tasks, and then subsequently um, outgoing commands that um, produce overt behavior. And again, we have this synchronization between slow frequency up oscillations and faster frequency oscillations. Uh, here's a study from the University of Zurich showing that complex tasks uh, involving sensory integration and decision making 
were associated with slower frequencies, in this case 4 to 7 hertz synchronization, intermediate tasks 13 to 18 hertz beta activity, um, the kinds of things kids do in elementary school, for example. And when we're working with kids who have problems with elementary school age types of tasks, uh, we often reward an increase in 13 to 18 hertz activity. Simpler, more localized tasks, as we saw in the primate study, happen at much faster frequencies because they're localized. Um, when we have complex events, it might seem counterintuitive, but the complex events require a longer oscillatory cycle. Think of uh, each oscillatory cycle as being a finite time period, like a window of opportunity within which processing can occur. So the more complex the task, the longer that window has to remain open for that task to occur. So groups of neurons closer distance interact most effectively when the firing windows are synchronous across long distances. The brain does not operate continuously, but does operate in discontinuous packets. Now we'll review instrumentation and electronics. Uh, differential amplifiers and so on. Remember differential amplifiers multiply signals that are the same and signals that are different between two inputs by different but constant factors. So that's the positive sensor and the negative sensor, each of which are compared to the reference sensor, but then the resulting signal at each of those inputs is then compared to each other. Anything that's different gets multiplied everything that's common gets multiplied by a small number. So a big number, a small number, that means that anything that's common essentially gets rejected. This ratio is called the common mode rejection ratio. And in this case, this example is 100 to 1 for a common mode rejection ratio. So there are two inputs, both uh, returning pathway to the client, if you will. Uh, a little more complicated than that, but basically they're being referenced to the ground connection from the subject. And anything that's in phase gets rejected, and anything that's out of phase gets retained. So signals that are waving at the same time and are in phase are rejected because they're too similar. Now they're in phase, and so they're the same signal. They get rejected by common mode rejection. If they're out of phase, waving at the opposite time, they both get retained. Amplitude is also a factor. If they are of the same amplitude, they get rejected. If they are different amplitudes, even if they're synchronous waves uh, in phase, they can still be retained if the amplitude is significantly different. So we have the common signal. We have the signal of interest. We compare those in the differential amplifier. We amplify the signal of interest. We get rid of this as much as we can of the common signal, which we're going to assume is 60 hertz noise or some other uh, uh, consistent signal in both inputs. And we amplify the signal of interest so it improves our signal to noise ratio. If we compare close sensors that are close to each other, it attenuates the process, the common mode rejection process attenuates the low, slower frequencies, the more rhythmic and synchronous frequencies, and rejects those because they're similar between these two locations, and retains those that are less synchronous, that are more asynchronous. If we compare a sensor to itself, we should get a flat line because it's identical and common mode rejection should reject all of it. Signals from locations that are farther apart, components of both signals will be retained as we see here. This component from the FP1 electrode referenced to the linked ears. This component from the O2 electrode referenced to the linked ears. The resulting combination signal from FP1 compared to O2 retains these two components, uh, one from here and one from here in the resulting signal. So the result is the composite signal is the difference between the two inputs. Anything that's common to both is rejected. Subsequently, we process the data after analog to digital conversion. 
we sample the data, we run it through the analog to digital converter. Uh, that happens after common mode rejection. Subsequently in the software we use transforms such as the Fourier transform, often called the fast Fourier transform or FFT or other transforms or we use digital filters to define the signal that we want to look at. The sample rate is generally 256 samples or higher. That's samples per second or hertz. The sample rate must be fast enough to accurately represent the signal. The Nyquist principle states that it must be at least two times the signal being measured. Aliasing results from sampling rate that is too slow for the signal being measured. This signal is being measured. This is an 11 hertz signal. Uh, here it's being sampled at 12 samples per second. Here this waveform is sampling it at 200 samples per second and so it's accurately representing that signal whereas the slower sample rate is giving us an alias signal that looks like a slow wave pattern. Now here we have two sample rates the same source in the scale. Here's the same signal, the incoming EEG signal sampled at 32 samples per second and you can see that we are lacking a great deal of information when compared to the same signal incoming sampled at 256 samples per second. Here we have excellent re resolution, excellent representation of the detail. Uh, Remember that shining a white light through a prism breaks it up into the different frequencies of light. We do the same thing with our EEG, uh, bringing in the raw signal, breaking it down into the different frequency bands using band pass filters. Frequency is associated with how many waves per second. It's not, it's uh, the number of waves per second counted as peak to peak or counted as zero crossings divided by two to give us how many times does it wave in one second. Amplitude is the measurement of voltage in that frequency band specifically. Peak to peak is the positive value and the negative value and the distance between the two. In this example 20 microvolts. How much energy, how big is it, uh, how much voltage displayed in microvolts. You can, we generally use the peak-to-peak -peak method. We can use the peak amplitude method just above the zero line or the root mean square method. You can also measure wavelength. How long does it take the wave to occur? Slower frequencies have longer wavelengths. Faster frequencies have shorter wavelengths. Then the raw electrical activity from the scalp is transformed by the hardware and into computer program software. We display that on our computer screens and that can be printed or transformed into displays that we can compare with each other. We have uh, components of that display in terms of sensitivity and gain related to amplification. So too much uh, specificity, a little bit more accurate level of specificity or sensitivity in terms of being able to see all the different components without being overwhelmed with too much detail that runs into each other. The gain happens in the amplifier. It's the boost of the signal that happens in the amplifier. Filters defined by the high pass filter, the low pass filter, and combined produce a band pass filter. So the high pass filter passes everything higher than the setting. The low pass filter passes everything lower than the setting. The band pass filter is a combination of the two. The order tells us how many samples are held in memory before our calculation to the computer screen is produced. Three band pass filters, delta, theta, and alpha, derived from the same common source. Here we have the raw signal. It's a 1 to 64 hertz filter, so it's a broadband filter. Uh, we have zero in the middle, positive negative values. We can convert that to an amplitude channel, an amplitude representation, by sampling it at a different frequency and changing it to all positive values. 
with the zero at the bottom instead of in the middle. So the same data is being represented by both signals. Uh, this gives us the ability to see the actual waveform. This gives us a representation of just the voltage of that waveform. Here we have the raw signal transformed by a Fourier transform, again often called a fast Fourier transform or an FFT. Uh, we have the spectral analysis where we have frequency in the X axis or the horizontal axis and the amplitude in the Y axis or the vertical axis. Each individual frequency bin has one vertical bar representing one second worth of data of data in the past. Here we have the magnitude spectrum, the amplitude over time, and squared magnitude is power, microvolt squared, and technically it should be over resistance, so it should be microvolt squared over resistance. So we have amplitude, power, and percent power, which is a conversion of the power value into a percentage value based on the uh, percentage of this particular frequency band, in this case alpha, compared to the EEG as a whole. Multiple different types of electrode materials. Uh, Gold-plated silver is common. That's what these are. Uh, silver electrodes are less common. Sintered silver-silver chloride electrodes are even less common, but are better electrodes generally. Polarization of the electrodes results from running a, a DC current through the circuit, which causes those uh, electrodes to be polarized, meaning that there is a buildup of electrical uh, electrons or mineral ions that prevent the uh, uh, comfortable or efficient flow of alternating current, current that flows in multiple directions. Bias potentials is sort of the same thing except that it's caused by mismatched electrode materials, worn electrode surfaces, uh, poor quality sensors, uh, the use of multiple different kinds of metals together in the same circuit, and so on. When we have those three sensors that we talked about, the requirement is at least a positive, a negative, and a ground reference, then it means that we get to choose where we're going to put our sensors. And the placement of the sensors is based upon the International 1020 system of electrode placement, where the distance between the sites is 10% or 20% of the total measurement between reference landmarks. There are 19 sites on the scalp, and then there are additional sites for reference, uh, for example, at A1 and A2, or in the mastoid at M1 and M2, uh, or possibly even uh, other locations for ground and um, system reference. The designated coordinated system is uh, uses number letter combinations. So we have frontal pole, frontal, central, parietal, temporal, and occipital. Even numbers are on the right, odd numbers are on the left, and Z is the midline, or vertex. We measure from the nasian to the inian uh, and get the total distance. And 10% up from that is FPZ. 20% uh, from that is FZ. And another 20% is CZ. Now that gives us 50%. And another 50% brings us back to uh, the inian. We do the same thing from the preauricular so point on one side to the other, and we can mark each of these locations again. 10% up is T3, 20% up is C3, another 20% is CZ. So again, 50% of the distance from left to right is in the central midline at CZ and gives you that location. So we start with the front to back measurement. We find this total distance, 10% up of that total distance, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 10%.
then we measure from side to side from the preauricular point on one side, which is this spot right here in front of the curve of the ear. Right here at the top of that curve, here's the ear canal in here. This is the preauricular point. We measure from that point on one side to that point on the other side, going over with our tape measure the previously marked CZ or CZ location. We can do the circumference. If we leave out OZ and FPZ, then every sensor location is 10% of the total circumference. We can find intermediate sites with, uh, by measuring between, for example, FP1 and C3, and between F7 and FZ, and halfway between those four measurements is the F3 electrode, similarly F4, P3, and P4. We can also use marking caps and guides to do this process, but we still need to measure at least for CZ from front to back and side to side, and measure up to the FP1, FP2 locations, and the O1 and O2 locations to determine that it's in the right place. There are multiple cap and electrode systems with embedded electrodes already placed at the right locations. Again, this still requires that we manually measure to be sure that each of these electrodes is in the right location. There's a more recent system called the Modified Combinatorial Nomenclature System, or the 1010 system, uh, that is uh, pictured in this view. Uh, much more logical progression, 13579, 13579, 13579, rather than uh, CZ, C3, T3, uh, and, for example, PZ, P3 and T5, which wasn't even a temporal site to begin with. So this is a much more logical system and uh, hopefully will be adopted soon. So that's a brief review. Again, if you ever are confused about some of the basics, you can review this uh, presentation again.